But it's wonderful to be here today and to speak to you. And today my topic is God, the cross, and you, though it could be titled The Way of the Cross Leads Home. Now today I am going to speak about the most important question you could ever answer or ask. It's more important than who will win the next election, though that is important. It's more important than whether or not the economy is going to go down or up. It's more important than whether or not COVID is going to have a number of different variants. Those questions have their importance, but there is nothing that compares to the question that we are going to answer today. And that question is simply this, how does a sinner who has many needs stand in the presence of a God who is impeccably holy and who demands perfection to connect with him and to live for him forever? That's the question, and it's the most important one that you can imagine. Now, you may be listening today, and you're a Protestant, you're a Catholic, maybe you are of no religion, maybe some other religion. No matter who you are, you and I have to appreciate the struggle of a man who actually changed history, entitled Martin Luther. Luther was in a monastery there in Erfurt, Germany, and he was trying to know, how can I be right with God? Now, he understood what us moderns don't understand, is that to be standing in God's presence and welcomed into his presence forever, you have to be absolutely perfect as God is. So he took advantages of all the things that were there in the monastery. There were the disciplines of the church, and he fasted until he fasted so long some people thought that he was going to starve himself to death. He slept on a floor, and uh, I've been to the monastery there, and those floors were stone cold, and he slept without blankets so that he could mortify the flesh. He did everything he possibly could. The only thing that gave him some solace were the sacraments. Confession especially was of some comfort to him, but um, what he knew was that he needed to confess all of his sins because all of them needed to be forgiven. And when you are there in the monastery, you can actually go to the room where the monks confess their sins to one another. When it was Luther's turn, he just went on and on and on. I'm sure the monks said, enough already, jawohl. End it, Martin. Next time, tell us about big sins like murder and adultery, but not all these little peccadillos, not all these little sins. His confessor was uh, Johann Staupitz, and Staupitz was so exasperated because sometimes Luther confessed his sins six hours at a time. And uh, Staupitz was exasperated, but Luther understood something, and he got into a dilemma. Sins, in order to be forgiven, had to be confessed, but if they were not confessed, they were not forgiven. And so how are you going to remember them all, and how are you going to confess them all? And then a worse problem developed, and that is he began to realize that tomorrow would be another day with brand new sins and brand new confession, and it would go on and on. It was something like mopping up the floor with a faucet running. Of course, in those days, you could also buy an indulgence, and if you saw some relic and paid a fee, you'd get some righteousness, but he never knew whether or not he had enough. The question is, how do you satisfy an entirely holy God who is absolutely demanding in terms of his requirements? That was Luther's issue. Now, he went to Rome. He thought he'd find help there. Uh, it was a three-month journey because they walked, of course, he and a, a companion, and they stayed in monasteries along the way. But he came back, and he was so disappointed. He said that if there was a hell, Rome was built on it because he saw the impropriety and the way in which the priests acted, and uh, he came home disillusioned. Then he was assigned to be a professor in a little town called Wittenberg. It was a new university. 
and he went there to lecture on ethics, but while he was there, finally Staupitz said to him, he came and visited him, you should begin to teach the Bible. So Luther began to teach the Bible. He came to Psalm 23, Psalm 23, and he began to realize Jesus was experiencing the same sense of existential despair and guilt as I have experienced. The German word is anfechtungen, a sense of being separated from God and being aware of your own need. He said, Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I wonder why he said that, Luther asked. Began to dawn on him that maybe the reason for that is for us. And then he got to the book of Romans and normally when I preach on the Reformation, I stop at Romans chapter one today, we're going to go to Romans chapter 3, and we're going to see the text there, and we'll see how light broke onto Luther's soul. The text of Scripture is taken, of course, from the third chapter of Romans, as I mentioned, and I found it there in the Bibles that are in front of you on page 941. When Paul is speaking in the third chapter of Romans, first of all, he's taking an in-depth look into the human heart, and what he sees is not at all pretty. Paul is saying that every one of us are condemned under sin. Very quickly, you'll notice that he says in verse 11, there's none that seeks after God, no, not one. You say, well, that's not true because I've been seeking after God. Maybe you say, well, yes, there are people who seek after the God that they want, the God that they desire, because we basically, especially in the West, we have domesticated God. We have made God a figment of our imagination that we can live with. Now, if you truly seek God, it's because God came seeking for you first because most people are running from God just like a thief might be running from a policeman. There's nobody who wants to stand in the presence of a holy God. And then Paul goes on to say, and I'm only listing it here, we are sinners by what we seek. We are sinners by what we say. You'll notice that they use their tongues for deceit. That's in verse 13. And all of us know that there's a lot of deceit within us. You know, you're called into question and you want to defend yourself and you arm yourself with a pack of lies. Years ago, I read the book entitled The Day America Told the Truth, and it was very disheartening to find out that surveys that were, of course, anonymous, where people admitted that they lie virtually every day. And it's all seen by God, and Paul says here that there are those who use their mouths to speak lies and to deceive. And then he says in verse 15, the violence is in their feet. In other words, they run after violence, and it's not just the physical violence that we know a lot about here in the city. It's also the violence in our hearts, the desire to get even, the desire to get what we don't deserve. And on it goes. And then finally, he says, we are sinners by what we see. He says, there is no fear of God before our eyes. Think of what your eyes saw this week. CNN, NBC, Fox News, movies that are oftentimes degrading. That's what we see with our eyes. Paul says here very clearly, there is no fear of God before their eyes. In other words, this is a therapist's dream to look into the human heart and see how deceptive we really are to the point where we don't even know it. That's what the Bible teaches. We're unaware of it. You know, there is a story that perhaps you heard about a man who was driving through the countryside and noticed on a barn that there were all of these targets and in the middle of every target there was an arrow. And he thought, I'm gonna stop and commend the farmer for his expert marksmanship. The farmer said, I didn't do that. He said, it's a kid that comes out from the town. He does this. He shoots all of the arrows into the side of my barn, and then he paints the targets around them. <laughs> and that's what you and I do. Paul says in verse 23, it's a very important verse in the Bible in chapter three, 
He says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The imagery there is of archery, where you shoot at a target and you always miss it. Paul says that we all come short of the glory of God. The question is, what do we do? Now, in the rest of this passage, what Paul is going to argue is that God did something that only God can do. Years ago, during the time of Christ, there was a Greek poet by the name of Horace. And Horace was a man who um, wrote plays, he wrote poetry, but he also was a critic of some of the plays in Greece. Because what happened is, during those uh, days of theater, they would uh, have a problem, there would be a plot that would be very confusing, and then God would be brought on the stage to resolve it. And Horace said these words. He said, you're bringing a God onto the stage too early. He said, only bring a God to the stage when the plot is so complex that only God is able to solve it. And that's where we have come. And God decided to solve this problem for us, but he did it in a way that is very interesting and that only God can do. God took all of human righteousness and he set it aside. He said, when I redeem humanity, there's no cooperation between me and mankind because all of our sins and everything that we do is tainted. He said, this is something that only I am able to do. We need a God to come onto the stage. Now that being said, this passage before us is like a prism that enables us to see the attributes of God. Not all the attributes of God, but three that I've outlined are very clear. And what we see is this explosion of information as to who God is, and then we'll see its implications for us. That's where we're going. Now, the first attribute that I'm going to refer to is the attribute of God's justice. Now, I'm going to read a passage, and I kind of begin in the middle. It's a little difficult, maybe, to grasp what is being said, but I'm going to unpack it for you. Paul says these words, that we are justified, verse 24, by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now notice, this was to show God's righteousness because of his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. A difficult text because it involves a lot of words. Let me help you. What Paul is saying is this, that the reason that Jesus Christ came is to display the righteousness of God, first of all, because of sins that he overlooked in the Old Testament. Years ago, there were some atheists who wrote a tract and they were making fun of God and they said, you know, a person is known by his friends. Well, if that's true, let's look at the Old Testament. There's Abraham, you know, who sinned. He actually lied and in effect threw his wife under the bus when they were in Egypt. He actually gave his wife to Pharaoh. How do you like that? And yet the Bible says Abraham was a friend of God. Well, isn't that nice? David, he commits murder and adultery. And yet he's described as a man after God's own heart. So the atheists were saying, God hobnobbed with all of these scoundrels in the Old Testament. What kind of a God calls these kinds of people your friends? Now, God had decreed that every sin committed had to be paid for. And so God, in the Old Testament, put all their sins on hold, so to speak, 
It's something like buying a fridge and you use a credit card and you enjoy it now, but you pay for it later. God says, I'm going to remove the barrier between me and man in Old Testament times, knowing that Jesus Christ is going to come, but I have a debt that needs to be paid. And so I set forth Christ in such a way that he would absolve me so that nobody could say, you know, God has all these friends who are sinners. Yes, he has all these friends that are sinners, to be sure, but he has paid for their sins. So the Apostle Paul is saying that the score has to be evened. Somebody has to pay for the sin. So we see the justice of God. You see, at the cross, there were two attributes of God that needed resolution. On the one hand, there was the justice of God. On the other hand, there was the love of God. Love said, I want to redeem. But the justice of God said there can be no redemption unless there is a payment for sin. The cross resolved that. You must understand that God is a very complex being indeed. The older I get, the more complex I realize. He really is. But it displays God's justice. That's what Paul says, so that he can be just and the justifier. But it also displays God's grace. Notice, I read it a moment ago, that we are justified, this is verse 24, by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It displays God's grace because the question was this, all right, there has to be a sacrifice for sin. All sin has to be paid for, but who is going to do it? And God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to pay the price. In other words, God says this again is something I have to do. I'm going to demand that sin be paid for, and then I'm the one who's going to do the paying and the punishment for sin, and I'm going to do it in Christ. We can understand this because of the Trinity. Years ago, there was a talk show entitled The Phil Donahue Show, and I remember Phil must have been interviewing a Christian or something. I forget the context, but at one point, Phil Donahue said, you know, if God loves the world, why did he just stay in heaven and send Christ to die? Why didn't he come out of heaven and do it himself? And I felt like shouting, Phil, in Jesus, God did it himself. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. God did it. When I was studying at the university, we used to have courses on um, comparative religion. I remember taking a couple of those, and one of the things was this. Well, Christianity is really no different from other religions because, after all, other religions demand a blood sacrifice too. Yes, that's true. But only Christianity teaches that God becomes the sacrifice. And when Jesus died on the cross, he propitiated, I know that that's a big word here in the text, he, in effect, satisfied all of the payment that is needed for sinners, and he took that upon himself. O Christ, what burdens bowed thy head, our load was laid on thee. Thou stoodest in the sinner's stead, didst bear all ill for me. Death and the curse were in our cup, O Christ, was full for thee. But thou hast drained the last dark drop, tis empty now for me. Years earlier, centuries earlier, Augustine, the great theologian and philosopher, said, O God, demand whatever you will, but you supply what you demand. Wow, takes your breath away. Now, Martin Luther is having a problem with all the guilt, the Unfechtungen he's experiencing. He comes across a passage like this, and actually the same thing is taught in Romans chapter 1, and he begins to realize that if we receive what God has done, we are justified. And what does the text say? I read it just a moment ago. 
we are justified by his grace as a gift. <laughs> it's the gift of righteousness. It has to be a gift because it is the kind of righteousness of which you and I have none. We can't add to it to make it better. We can't subtract to it to somehow lessen its ability. And so what Luther's recognized is that if I come to trust Christ savingly, that righteousness is credited to my account. And not only that, it's a perfect righteousness given indiscriminately to all who believe. Out of this comes the priesthood of the believer. You see, in those days, the idea was that if you wanted to really get to God, you go to a priest, and the priest has special dibs, special relationship with God on your behalf. <laughs> Luther said, you know what? Maybe nobody's ever heard of you. You may be overworked. You may be underpaid. Nobody really knows your name, but you have come to faith in Christ. You have all the same rights and privileges and opportunities as anyone else because you have the same righteousness as the most wonderful person that you know. It's, it's God's righteousness credited to you. 24 hours a day, God demands perfection. 24 hours a day, Jesus supplies what God demands. Not only that, but it's a permanent righteousness. Let me ask you, do you think that Luther was saved when he was there in the monastery confessing his sins regularly? Of course not. And the reason is, you know, there are thousands, millions of people are going to go to churches today to confess their sins, but they're going to leave with a lot of uncertainty because yeah, next week I have to confess the same sins. And, you know, this, uh, you know, there's just, there's just, we don't know how many requirements we have to meet. We're working at it. We're hoping that we'll make it, but there can be no assurance. Of course, there can't be any assurance if it depends upon you. Now, what Luther discovered is that this will take me all the way to heaven. One of the first doctrines he dropped was, um, the doctrine of purgatory, because purgatory was based on the notion that most people die and they're too good to go to hell, but they're not good enough to go to heaven. So they have to be purged in the fires of purgatory long enough until all the sin is burned away and then they can be in God's presence. Luther said, no, now that I understand that righteousness is a gift, I can accept that. And as I've emphasized, it doesn't matter how high God's standard is as long as he meets it for me. Luther made the statement that my sins belong to Jesus, thank you very much, and it'll take me all the way to heaven. As we sometimes sing, standing in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne, fully justified in the presence of a holy God. Now, does that mean that Christians don't have to confess their sins? Of course they do, but they don't do it to gain the righteousness. That is theirs all the way to heaven. They do it because God uses it as a discipline. Sometimes Christians have to repent. We have to deal with sin regularly because God wants us to live holy lives. But once we belong to God, we are his and our eternity is secure. Now, that's why the Reformation was so powerful, is that suddenly God was accessible to everyone who believed. So we have in this text a reference to the justice of God, which had to be satisfied. But thankfully also magnified for us is the grace of God that actually saves us as sinners though we are so undeservingly. Now, something else, another attribute that's mentioned is, of course, the glory of God. That's not stated exactly in the text, but clearly, clearly all throughout the Bible, it talks about we're saved to the glory of God. And part of this reason was because of the fact that uh, it's not just these attributes of God, but the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, the ingenuity of God was displayed at the cross when Jesus died. Think of it this way, follow me. 
We are saved by God. We are saved from God, namely his wrath and anger against sin, for the glory of God. We are saved, let me repeat it, we are saved by God, from God, his wrath, for God, for his glory. So the point to be made is simply this, that God's glory is displayed. Now there are certain uh, implications of this. First of all, we must recognize that God purchased us at high cost. We have no idea the price that Jesus paid to satisfy justice and the wrath of God against sin. We just don't understand it. Maybe that's why when Jesus died and when that payment was made, there was darkness over the whole land. And the darkness was there because did not Isaac Watts write, well might the sun in darkness hide and shut its glories in when Christ the great redeemer died for man, the creature's sin. No human eye even saw it. It was dark. It was something between the father and the son. Rebecca and I know a couple, and we were sitting out on their balcony in Colorado a couple of years ago, and they have a little dog called Annie. Little Annie is a white dog that runs around the house. And they pointed out that um, Annie, they spent $7,000 because she was lame on her back legs, and um, $7,000 worth of surgery and little Annie can now run around wherever she wants to go, sitting there at breakfast. The idea occurred to me that that's really a picture of us. Little Annie has no idea how much was paid so that she could walk. All that she knows is, I was lame, now I walk. Brothers and sisters, we have no idea of the payment that was made on our behalf. All that we know is once we were lost, now we are found. Once we walked in darkness, now we walk in light. Once we were overcome by our guilt, now we are overcome by our acceptance in the presence of God, and we rejoice in that, but you and I do not understand the amount that was paid by Jesus to save us from God's wrath. Now, that's one lesson that we have to learn, but there's another that we have to learn, and that is that God is free now to save sinners. That's really good news. The man who founded this church, D.L. Moody, though he never preached here, it was actually in a different place back in 1864. He had only about a grade three education, but my, he was a man who was able to motivate people and preach to large crowds. And um, he was always looking for sinners because he knew that if you find a sinner, that's very good because then you can point him to a savior. In one of his messages, he says, a young man told me last night that he was too great a sinner to be saved. Well, they're the very men for whom Christ came. The only charge they had against Christ is that he was receiving bad men. They were the very kind of men he was willing to receive. All that you have to do is to prove that you're a sinner and I'll prove that you've got a savior. And the greater the sinner, the greater the savior. You say, well, my heart is hard. Well, then of course you want Christ to soften it, but you can't do that yourself. The harder the heart, the more you need Christ. If your sin rises up before you like a dark mountain, bear in mind, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. There is no sin so big or so corrupt or so vile, but that the blood of Christ can cover it. Truth be known, there may be some of you here who have committed huge sins. I mean, we're talking about crimes. And uh, grace, grace is such a scandal because grace pays no attention to the greatness of your sin. Now, of course, it's much better, of course, if you live a good life rather than the life of a criminal. I get that much better in many respects. But as far as grace is concerned, 
the righteousness of God can be applied to you just as easily as it can be applied to anyone else. It's almost the scandal of grace. A few years ago, I read a book entitled The Chaplain of Nuremberg. Do you remember during the Hitler era after the war, there were the Nuremberg trials. There were six uh, Catholics and 15 Protestants. And uh, the United States government thought that they should have a chaplain for these, so they took a man from St. Louis who was a conservative, gospel-preaching Lutheran, and they said, you're the chaplain to these men. Some people said, don't ever even shake hands with them. But he did. He thought, how can I reach them with the gospel if I'm not willing to connect with them? By the way, when he had his services, many of them attended and all of them knew the Lord's Prayer, all of them knew the Creed. Why that makes you think, what went wrong there? And uh, Goering, who ended up cheating the executioners because he took some cyanide that he had smuggled in, he wanted to take communion. And Gerke, the pastor, said, no. Have you confessed that you are in need of a savior? Have you admitted that you are a sinner who needs Christ? And Goering said, no. So he wasn't given communion. But Gerig said, that he believes that five of these men, possibly six, were saved. Ribikoff, who was Hitler's uh, henchman and foreign minister, before he died said, I entrust my soul to the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross to forgive my sins. Now, if you feel offended by that, Join the club because I read that and I did not like that. What in the world is God doing saving people like that? But then I began to realize, God says, I think so much of what Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross that I can even forgive a Nazi who repents of his sin and believes in me, but I cannot forgive a good tax-paying, patriotic American who does not believe in me. It is all about Jesus, and it is all about the cross. You say, well, what do I have to do to receive this gift? <laughs> Let me tell you. You have to admit that you are a sinner. Get over the idea that you justify yourself and think to yourself that you can kind of do this on your own. Years ago, when I used to speak to everybody on the plane, Rebecca and I have been doing an awful lot of traveling, by the way, just trip after trip as I speak into various places. But nowadays, of course, with the masks, we don't. But in the days when, um, if you can remember pre-COVID, I used to talk to virtually everybody, and I was in discussion with this woman who, it was very clear, was quite self-righteous. She was knowing better than God about a lot of different things. Now, normally, I'm very nice. I'm so nice sometimes that it's hard for me to really tell people the gospel. But I knew that she needed a little bit of strong medicine, so I said to her, would you consider yourself to be ungodly? Well, she was offended, and she said, of course I'm not ungodly. I said, you know, that's too bad. That means that you can't participate in anything that Jesus did on the cross for you. She said, why? I said, the Bible says Christ died for the ungodly. So if you're not ungodly, there isn't much we can do to help you. You're just going to go on your own record, and it's going to be a terrible record terrible record. You standing in the presence of a holy, impeccable God who needs perfection for you to be accepted, if you are not clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, your eternity is going to be one of damnation. Okay, I said it. So what you have to do is to admit your sinfulness, and then you have to see that Jesus is a Savior that you can believe in because he paid the debt of all those who would believe in him. And so you receive him as your Savior and say, from this moment on, Jesus, I acknowledge my helplessness and my sin, and I come to transfer my trust 
to you alone, and you will be saved, and you will be received, and you will be justified. There is a story that I've not been able to confirm, but it probably happened, about um, a boy who was lost on a street, and uh, he didn't know his address, so the police were trying to help him, and they said, what building are you next to? And he said, I live next to a big church, and they didn't know which church it was, which church was it? You know, the town had lots of churches. He said, it's the church that has the big cross in front. And uh, he said, uh, I live close to there. And the police knew what that church was. And the boy said, just take me to the cross and I'll find my way home. Ever since I turned 80, I've been doing a lot of thinking because you do know that the statistics on death are very impressive. Have you noticed that? <laughs> and I've been thinking that my day is going to come. I hope it's still a ways off. But even if this were the last message I were to ever preach, I'd pour my heart out to you and say, take me to the cross and I'll find my way home. Right now, you can believe on Christ no matter where you're hearing this message. Admit your sinfulness. And if you're a great sinner, you've got a great Savior if you believe in Jesus Christ alone. Father, use this message, we pray, and uh, bring about light where there is darkness. Help people to give up their natural propensity to self-justification. May we see ourselves in your presence and then recognize that Jesus justifies the greatest of sinners. And the greatest of sinners who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon, receives. We ask in his blessed name, amen.